Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I would like to um, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Azra Ali. Uh, so, Dr. Ali Abbas, Azra Ali's uh, uh, educational scholarship and clinical practice focuses in two areas. Uh, he's a geriatrician, so geriatric psychiatry and the practice of culturally attuned psychiatric uh, practice in psychiatry in general. Uh, Dr. Azra Ali is the current geriatric psychiatry fellowship director, and he coordinates the geriatric psychiatry seminar series for the general psychiatry residents. Uh, he is at the Michael DeBakey's uh, VA Medical Center, and he's responsible for uh, the delivery of ECT. Um, in terms of uh, cultural psychiatry, Dr. Azra Ali uh, has been presenting locally as well as uh, nationally on ways in which trainees and practitioners can work towards improving their cultural attunement to uh, best serve their patients. So, so I, I actually found out about him after um, uh, doing some lit search and finding a paper that he and some of his colleagues had done uh, on, um, on, on this very topic. Uh, and I was delighted that he agreed to come and speak to us. And I was also delighted to see his interest in cultural psychiatry. So as, uh, you know, as our trainees know, uh, one of our, a big element in our, uh, residency is, uh, is military culture and, uh, and how it impacts our practice. So, um, so we have to do a lot of, for the lack of a better word, indoctrination into not being a, just a psychiatrist, but but how to be an effective uh, military psychiatrist. And really the emphasis there ends up being on understanding and navigating the culture of, of military. And then within military, there's all these subgroups that you have to navigate. So anyway, delighted to have you, uh, Dr. Adler Ali and I. And I'm really grateful and hopefully we'll be able to reciprocate uh, the favor from our program uh, if we can do anything for your program. So I'll uh, have you uh, tell us more about high value care um, as psychiatrists. Okay, so great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amin, for introducing and uh, really the invitation. It's very gratifying that, you know, uh, in academics, you do a lot of writing and presenting, and you don't know how much of it sticks. So it's good when somebody kind of finds something you've done and um, uh, once uh, has interest in that. Um, high value care is something that you know I've been interested in for a while, and probably is one of the reasons I chose to work at the VA um, and work in a public sector, uh, because one of the drivers for me personally is just making sure that. Uh, we can do the most for the people for whom we provide care um, and remembering that resources are not infinite and there's um, and, and depending on how you, one defines resources most people think uh, fiscally but there's also time there's also intellect there's also uh, the training resources there's just a lot of resources um, that we sometimes don't always think about and uh, what I really like about public sector psychiatry is about making sure that uh, in a world where things are not infinitely available, how do you still do good and how, how do you make sure that you make the most of what you have? Uh, and that's the perspective that I brought into this. Um, so let me start uh, with the presentation. Uh, please, um, let's see, I do have uh, people, again, I'm not totally familiar. I don't know how, if there's a raise hand function, but uh, let's just see if, if people have questions and we're kind of plugging along, please unmute yourself and ask a question if something's not clear or you want more information about something, uh, happy to add uh, to it. Uh, but here are the objectives of our course, uh, to be able to describe uh, nature of current cost crisis, appreciate need to expand and integrate cost considerations, and then also strategies for providing high value cost effective care um, in psychiatry. So uh, I always want to start with the definition and this is kind of the easiest way of kind of conceptualizing it is high value means improvement in health outcomes uh, over 
money spent. So whatever we can do that improves health outcomes without increasing money spent necessarily increases value and vice versa. Um, if you reduce the cost and keep uh, the uh, health outcomes static, you still have increased the value. All right. So th that is that is the way that I I like to try to think about things. So I mean, um, a common question in uh, psychiatry is, you know, we will talk about medications because that's where a lot of our cost comes. Here's uh, another kind of representation of that. And I mean, I, I, I would really recommend that sometimes it, when you have the time to kind of think about uh, this and see where you would put your um, health care, uh, that particular practice in. So here's a grid and uh, you have four quadrants. The green one is lower expenditure and higher life expectancy. All right, uh, so life expectancy in this case is the outcome. So that that is great, right? So you so you uh, your denominator is low and your numerator is high. Lower expenditure and lower life expectancy, not so good. It's kind of like the adage: you get what you pay for. Um, higher expenditure and higher life expectancy. Again, the, uh, there would be an assumption: you put more in and you get more out of it. And then there's the red: higher expenditure, lower life expectancy. And that you know that's perhaps by some definition the worst because you're you're putting a lot in and you don't even get to uh, you're not seeing what you would want out of it or should see out of it um, so think about as you know we order tests as we order medications as we order let's see you back in two weeks rather than four weeks let's see you back next week or let my nurse call, uh, you know let the nurse call you uh, those are all aspects that carry some sort of price tag with it so let's, uh, before we uh, explore more about how we can influence, you know, why worry about this? Americans spend over twice as much per capita on healthcare as the average developed country. So just, here's, here's an example of where we are. Um, start with some place like India, which is very large, um, spends maybe, you know, less than $1,000 per person. Uh, maybe some would say not a fair comparison. Uh, they're a very different economy. They're very different resources. Their grid is going to be more in that lower expenditure in general. They, they, they may not have the capacity to go into that higher expenditure areas. So well, what about uh, places like Italy and Japan, right? I mean, Japan has some of the highest life expectancies in the country, in the world. They tend to have really good, healthy people. They spend just about four and a half thousand dollars per person. Um, other comparable nations like Australia, United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, you can see how much less they spend per person uh, than the United States. And therefore, if you, if you look at this grid again, if you think that we are providing high value care, then the US would be in the blue quadrant with high expenditure, higher life expectancy. We know that's not true, right? And unfortunately, if you see the data from even uh, COVID-19 that last year, our life expectancy dropped more than most other developed nations. Uh, that had tremendous impact from COVID-19, but still the impact on our society was even gr greater, even though we have very high expenditures. So why care uh, about cost? Someone else is paying for it, right? And and this may be, an, um, and I don't know if I'll have the opportunity, I asked Dr. Amin if it's okay if I stick around for like kind of the part two of this, where uh, somebody's going to talk to you about specific costs in the military. Um, I'm not very familiar with military, but in the VA, that often is the the way that people think about it uh, is that oh well it's you know the veteran doesn't have to pay for this so it's okay you know it's 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 sort of a free for all because uh, it's all paid for in a way the government's kind of collecting the tab um, similarly in private sector sometimes the assumption is well uh, this is someone with insurance the insurance has got it like you know I don't need to worry about it because the end user or the, the patient slash the client, they don't, they're not going to see this. So my behavior doesn't necessarily influence what they pay. Well, let's look at that. Um, hey, Dr. Yeah. Carly, the, uh, I've heard the criticism uh, that the United States actually invests a lot more money into um, certain types of medical research that benefit the rest of the world and that this helps to push down their healthcare costs. So it makes sort of a the false 
uh, picture that they're spending less and getting more when actually they're benefiting from the spending of the United States. Is that something that um, you, you've ever heard before or have any kind of response to? Yeah, so that, that is a really interesting uh, part of it. So, so this is healthcare cost, right? So this, this is not like NIH funding, NIMH funding, uh, pharma, R&D. Uh, but, but a lot of those discussions come up there is that, oh, well, the only reason, say, uh, Australia gets to negotiate prices of medications is because the U.S. is paying high uh, prices. And if the U.S. didn't pay those high prices, the, uh, the manufacturer or the uh, research and development wouldn't be able to be supported. And if it wasn't supported, then nobody would have these medications. So in a way, um, sort of U.S. is carrying that load. Um, the, the other part of that is often is uh, pharma will often say that, well, if no one's going to pay, well, if the U.S. is not going to pay us, well, we're going to move all our R&D out of the U.S. We have no reason. You, your, your costs are expensive here. We have to pay people much more. We, we can easily just move to a country where we can do this more cheaply. So that's kind of that, where that uh, weird dynamic comes up where, uh, but uh, but but the bottom line is is that the belief is is that there's a middle road. The U.S. doesn't have to be paying astronomically, um, and uh, should be in a position to negotiate prices. So, as an example, right, the VA gets to negotiate prices um, uh, with uh, man manufacturers of medications, and, and I'll talk mostly about medications only because we're psychiatry and we, we don't do many procedures or non-pharmacotherapeutic interventions. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but Medicare does not, and that's explicitly little, written into law, that Medicare is not allowed, or, uh, you know, the, the U.S. government, uh, CMS, is not allowed to negotiate prices. It doesn't really make sense. It's a high volume, high utilizer Medicare. Um, if you look at the just demographics, older adults are the people who use most treatments the most. Um, so if, if there were going to be cost savings, it would be very well realized there. So where's the middle ground? Can we find a middle ground uh, is the hope. I, I hope that got to, is that Dr. O'Leary? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So let's look at, you know, costs. Um, so uh, here's the average bottom 90% earnings, right, of what people are, and that's where earnings have gone from 2000 to 215. And, and then you look at what people are paying and you see that family premiums and single premiums have gone up at a much fast, higher rate, right? So uh, premiums have gone from about 5,000 to 18,000 a year, a whole lot, a whole lot more. So imagine if you're barely making more, uh, but now your premiums have gone up that much more. Um, now here's back to that grid. So just again, showing some information about where we are. So if you look at life expectancy, so here's the USA. Um, can you, I, I don't know if you can see my, can you see the pointer? Yes. Yes, okay. see it move, yeah. yes. So the USA is in the unfortunate quadrant, right? High expenditure, low life expectancy. So it's a kind of, a, in a way, a lose-lose because we're spending a lot, but we're not necessarily seeing all the benefits for it. So it's about how we spend it, not about how much we spend. And then you look at a lot of those other countries that I had on that chart. There's there's Japan with you know high expenditure, but then you know they, they seem to be seeing a lot of benefits. There's Great Britain. It had much lower uh, than Japan, but uh, it's uh, it's still in the kind of the quadrant where you have high uh, expenditure and uh, high life expectancy. And then there are some of these where, um, again, I didn't look into what explains why even with low expenditure, they have a fairly good life expectancy. Um, there can certainly be some um, sociocultural and political reasons as well for that, but uh, then there's a whole group of those folks as well. And then uh, one more comparison. Um, so this is by the Economic Policy Institute about here's the US. All right, a U.S. on health system attributes relative to score of 10. And so if the U.S. is a one in everything but care process, and care process is defined by like care coordination, access to care, the U.S. is sort of below its uh, advanced country peers. Right? Again, and remembering that we tend to spend 
anywhere from 50 to 100% more than most other uh, comparable countries. So if US is, a, is one in terms of equity of care, and I know that you're getting, uh, is gonna be talking about that later today, Here's US and the, uh, the country with the lowest scoring non-US countries far ahead and the highest is so much further. So our, our care is not necessarily even equitable, even though we spend quite a bit on it. Now, um, high cost is relevant to psychiatry specifically, and this is from SAMHSA. So if you see here's, uh, and I don't know why they've chosen these colors. They're all kind of like shades of brown, but I, I, I looked at it carefully to kind of make sure I knew which ones were which. So here's 1986, medications were only about 8% of that cost. Became 28% in 2009 and then 14. And any ideas why it might be going down to 26% projected, uh, it, this was a projection for 2020. So the main reason is, is uh, you know, I, I trained uh, starting 2000 uh, in uh, re for residency, and it was like the heyday of brand named atypical antipsychotics. Everything we used was brand name because everything was so new: olanzapine, quetiapine, risperidone, aripiprazole, um, and then um, oh, and ziprazidone. Those were our big five. Everything was brand name. Everything had come out within the last three to five years. So most of those, many of those are going off patent. So a lot of the medications, same for antidepressants, Cetal, uh, you know, it was really like we use, uh, Lexapro came out when I was a resident, but um, we used all the antidepressants were brand named as well when I first started. So a lot of those are now coming off brand and that's, that's why they're expecting the cost to go down is that we'll have a whole slew of drugs that were developed in the 90s that will be fully uh, available in generics. Uh, but in psychiatry, you can see that is the single uh, biggest cost. Uh, hospitals and long-term care are uh, thereafter, along with office-based professionals, which is really most of us. And so while, uh, while uh, what I want us to remember is while we make up about 20% of the cost, you'll see that our influence is greater than 20% of the cost. As, uh, by us, I mean uh, office-based professionals and our salary, per se. Okay, any questions about at least kind of three, there was a lot of kind of data. Right. Great. Um, so here's, here's uh, the, the same thing that I was saying about uh, the drugs in the pipeline. So the good thing is, is that while there are more and more uh, branded names, overall our new generic medications uh, available as generics is helping temper some of the psychiatry costs. Okay, so we'll kind of play a game of family feud. I'm not gonna use the software and things that takes a little while, but here you go. Uh, the question is, when asked who has the major responsibility for reducing healthcare costs, physicians endorsed. All right, so what we'll do is we're gonna do what's called a chat blast. Um, everyone type into your chat box, but do not hit enter, all right? Um, so think about it for about 10 seconds, put it in your chat box. And when I say enter, then we'll go ahead. Okay, go ahead, hit enter. All right, I love it. I'm working with people in the DOD. They, they, they like me think everyone blames the government for everything. It's like it's always the government's fault. What has the government ever done for me? <laughs> right, so let's see. All right, I see a lot of governments. We'll, we'll compare uh, the chat box results with this. So, so most physicians believe trial lawyers, 60%. You know, if it, if it weren't for the suits, our costs wouldn't be that great. It's those healthcare insurance companies. They're the ones who are making all the money. They're driving up these costs. It's the hospitals and healthcare systems. It's the ph uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers, right? And then patients, somehow, you know, most, uh, more physicians, about half the physicians feel like patients are driving up the cost. And then finally, about a third of the physicians feel like maybe they have something to do with driving up the cost as well. As the people who actually deliver the healthcare, they seem to have very little confidence in their ability to, uh, to control or influence that. 
So, uh, so looking at uh, kind of responses, I see, you know, compared to those ones, a lot of government, big pharma, uh, residents, um, residents really help costs, thankfully. So thank you. Um, Medicare, yeah, so insurance. Now, physicians control as much as 60 to 80% of expenditures cost linked to decisions about, so that's, that's that key. So we make up, like our salaries, for instance, make up about 20% of the cost. Then our decisions in further determine a lot of the rest of the cost, right? Uh, what medications we're gonna order. Again, in psychiatry, it's very finite, right? We, and we tend to have relatively lower cost compared to many other specialties. But, uh, but if you think about in general, larger, you know, how many diagnostics, you know, are you gonna get that biopsy? Are you gonna get the, uh, are you going to get the CT or are you going to get the chest X-ray? Are you going to get the spiral CT that's more expensive or are you going to get just the regular CT? Are you going to get it with contrast? Now you've added, you know, are you going to, uh, is it going to be a fluoroscopy? So now you've added an anesthesiologist potentially, an interventional radiologist, all, you know, you, we, we keep, so many of those, we influence a large portion of the cost, even though we may not see Kind of that in our we're not it doesn't mean that we are directly benefiting from it or it's to further our own salaries or income it's just that we we influence it a lot so i, I think that is why it's so critical to remember that it's not just the patients it's not just the lawsuits it's not just big pharma it's us as the people who are the vendors you know we're the ones who are in the driver's seat for many of these decisions uh, I don't want to make it sound like physicians are just like doing everything without involving patients and things, but ultimately, you know, it, 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 so many of our patients are going to do what we recommend or think is the best next step. So quick, quick question on this topic. Yeah. So, you know, in, in my mind, and I may be totally off, but I, among the 60 to 80% linked to diagnostic testing and treatment, if you a slice of this would be the medications that we prescribe. I, I, I feel like the prices in our country here are just crazy skewed um, in terms of expenses. So, so last year I went to Pakistan and a cousin of mine works in a NGO type of environment with, with uh, people with addiction. One of the things they do is they screen everyone for hep C and then they treat them with the, those novel uh, antivirals. So when I realized that, I said, how do you guys afford that? That's like $40,000 treatment for eight week therapy. Uh, and he said, no, we, we pay $170 for that. So then, I, so then I was trying to rationalize how crazy that is, $170 versus 40,000. So I said, it's gotta be fake drugs in there. He said, no, no, we actually do post-treatment uh, assessment, and uh, we have a 99% cure rate because uh, they confirm uh, with uh, with um, viral load. So um, any thoughts or comments on that? And I think this kind of goes back into uh, Ryan O'Leary's um, point earlier. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, th th I, I think being in the U.S., that is one thing. Now, um, this is also a philosophical issue, right? So. Um, it's about this issue of, say, again, we'll, we'll limit it to psychiatry. Uh, well, when we limit it to psychiatry, we end up talking about, about medications mostly. But just remind, remember that we are not the most expensive specialty by any means, um, and that our, uh, our interface with medical procedures and diagnostics is the most limited of almost any specialty. Um, so just keep re uh, remembering that. But uh, when, when, you know, we we tend to bear in the US a very large cost. We are also as a community not very comfortable with saying there's some things even though they're available, you don't get to have them, <laughs> right? So that's called a formulary, right? Um, and not everyone wants, uh, is comfortable with kind of that dispensation of, uh, of healthcare services that is predetermined or or reduced based on what you have, so so we, we're comfortable with that in some ways, but not as a, a nation. People want to have that that potential opportunity 
to get whatever they want if they're at some cost versus no it's just like if you look there's no drop down menu order for it it does not it might as well not exist in this world because i cannot order it that is something now other countries are more comfortable with that they say here's what it is we will get the three these are the three medications we will have and these are countries so not you know the va does that for instance we have a formulary uh, does dod have a formulary yeah they have a formulary you know uh, certainly county systems have formularies uh, health insurances have formularies uh, the reality is is that formularies exist but uh, but as individuals we don't want to hear that um, so what becomes is that the, the 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 marketplace in the U.S. is very large uh, because of the way that things are dispensed. So that uh, so that's a kind of a just just a, just a way in which we perceive our uh, dis, uh, you know access to healthcare as well, which is important. But yes, I mean definitely the whole cost thing. Um, uh, this was right very relevant very recently about uh, Pfizer. And Moderna allowing for uh, other countries to make it right because once other countries are allowed, then suddenly instead of paying five hundred dollars a dose or whatever it is that the U.S. is paying, um, everybody can start getting it for like pennies or dollar, uh, you know, double digit dollars. Um, the cost will go down completely, and that will definitely impact how much they make. So it sounds like it's very intertwined. You know, policies affecting our uh pie of the uh, our slice of the pie right yes thanks um how is it again relevant uh just look at this reasons for not receiving mental health services and sorry this is old i couldn't get it uh, more updated on this one but uh when you look at this about 47 45 percent said could not afford and then uh, health insurance does not cover enough treatment I mean, I, went, I, I just recently shifted uh, health insurance and one of these prescription things that I get all the time went from like $9 to $20. I mean, you know, I mean that's a substantial uh, bump. Th luckily, it's something that I need only twice a year. So I'm like, okay, you know, uh, not a biggie. But if it's something that you were doing on a week or a monthly basis and the cost doubled, uh, and for so many of us, uh, that is, uh, an extra $150 a month now, uh, a year, that you have to uh, make sense of. So uh, just talk about in a study of 660 patients underusing medication, 67 never told a clinician in advance they plan to underuse medication. Uh, when they asked, like, well, well, why didn't you tell anyone? Uh, and they said nobody asked them about their ability to pay for it. 58% said they didn't think the providers could help them. And that's the part that makes you really sad, is that they think, like, even if I told you, you wouldn't be able to do much or anything about it. Um, and I, you know, I, we really want to change that dialogue. We want them to know that while we can't fix everything in the moment, we are part of the solution. Uh, patients are most likely clinicians, if clinicians talk to them about medication costs, ask them about problems paying for prescriptions, and offer advice. So uh, maybe... I you know I don't know how to do gallery view while sharing so it kind uh, but if someone could uh, volunteer uh, if you've talked if you've been to a physician as a patient and talked to them about cost has anyone talked to their uh, clinician about cost? So this is Chelsea. Um, I have a husband who does post heart transplant, and so cost comes into a lot of our conversations in the civilian sector. Okay, right. Uh, for sure. I mean, that that a uh, lot of complexity, a lot of uh, providers, a lot of providers maybe not communicating, doing different things, um, thinking that they have just the right solution to everything, and um, uh, definitely not keeping in mind necessarily about the whole big picture. So I can imagine where cost could easily spiral. And, and with no one entity taking responsibility. So, um, yeah, I bring up, uh, I, I, uh, I would, they found these uh, to be counterproductive as a pay, but when uh, you do ask about cost, the physician doesn't know, found these questions to be counterproductive as a patient. 
Correct. So I think that that is uh, so, Dr. Rusling. Thanks for mentioning that, and that's that's partly why we're having this discussion, is right? So we can be part of the solution, so that when people come to us, and again, it may not be extremely relevant in DoD because you do have a formulary, you, you may not have those discussions. But if you're having those internal dialogues um, for yourself about how high value care am I providing uh, the patient, may, even without the patient asking, uh, that would help you provide the highest value care. So, uh, and we'll come, uh, Dr. Rusling, we'll come to that toward the end about what could we do as uh, physicians and clinicians that could help improve that dynamic. All right, so we'll do another question. What are the barriers to discussing costs with patients? It's like Dr. Rusling set us up. We'll do the same kind of chat blast. Everyone uh, take a few seconds to type in an answer. And then when I say go, we'll hit enter. Okay, go. All right, thanks. Okay, let's compare to this study. Lack of time, you know, you're rushed. When are you gonna have this conversation with someone? Uh, lack of solution. Um, so again, I, I think Dr. Rusling has already mentioned that uh, discomfort, ugh, talking about money, geez. Uh, our, uh, my psychothe our, our psychotherapy clinic director, when I was a resident, made us take, uh, so this is a lot of years ago, 15, 16 years ago, credit cards were not that common in clinical settings. So, but he would make us take uh, the payment at the end of the therapy session from our patients. He's like, yeah, you guys don't get to just let the bill, like the clinic build. And, you know, we were in a cash. I mean, people had such high bills. They're like, you guys need to, this has to be part of your therapy. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, fear of compromised quality. Like if I bring up money or if I'm thinking about money, does that mean I'm delivering low value care? That's a real concern. And then lack of knowledge. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Like why talk about something I don't know about? Um, so I think this uh, this this lack of time. Um, so I'm going to share some personal information, just hopefully for illustrative purposes. So I actually loved my... Uh, parents physician he's a internist but not a geriatrician but uh, he was just so good and I, I would go with my parents to their visit so finally after not going to the doctor for about four years I, I went to I, I chose him as he was on my plans I chose him and you know we had a lot he always makes time to have high value care discussions he took my parents up all the multivitamins that were on he like reduced doses um, he talked about a lot of the solutions, and but even he said, you know, at some point I do have to kind of move on. And he was giving the example about uh, someone who wanted uh, a chest X-ray, and they're like, he was like, you know, I mean, I explained it to them. There's silence. I need to move on. I ordered the chest X-ray. So lack of time, even for the well-intended and well-informed, can eventually uh, prevent people from doing things. I see a lot of uh, people mentioning knowledge in the chat box. No solution. Feel like DoD will pay for everything. Exactly. So very similar to the VA system as well. There's the discomfort also mentioned. We just don't know enough about cost. What do we do? Great. Um, so thank you, Dr. Amin, because I think a lot of the residents' kind of concerns will be addressed in the next hour or so. So discuss cost. What can we do about it? That works like aspirin costs much, much more, right? What are the barriers and then what can be done? So here's another study. Uh, 79 believe patients would want to speak about out of pocket costs. So 80% of us think, yeah, if you ask a patient, they probably would want to talk about it. Their thing should be considered in treatment planning. 63 patients want to, I mean, so th this seems like we're all good with this. We think this is a good thing. We're all, we're all on board. About 35 of us have ever talked about cost, uh, you know, based on the survey. And what about how many patients have ever discussed? About 15, so even fewer. So maybe those physicians are talking about it with the same people <laughs> it's like over and over. What are the barriers? Discomfort, not enough time, didn't think physicians would have a solution. Physicians wanted but decided they didn't have not enough time. 
So again, you see that patients and physicians have similar uh, barriers that they identify. Discomfort and time um, really come up a lot and then not having a solution. So I think when you think about the three things that you may want to address based on the chat box comments as well as the survey is that we need to get over our discomfort. We need to not only get over our discomfort, but make it more comfortable for the patient. Uh, we need to figure out where does the time come for, for this? And uh, we need to be informed enough so that we can come up with some solutions. All right, the third activity. Uh, what do you do to help patients with out-of-pocket prescription costs? And again, this may not be very common, but you may be thinking about it even as you as a patient. And uh, we'll wait to enter as when I say go. Okay, go. All right, great. So I see switch to, uh, Dr. Bell has switched to generic. That's the most commonly reported one, office samples, right? Office samples, remember, is, comes out of the pharmaceutical in, uh, company's marketing uh, budget. So just that hopefully reminds you about what the purpose is of uh, office samples. Remind yourself when you use office samples, really it's a good marketing tool. Review and discontinue non-essential meds. Switch to cheaper brand, right? So I see a lot of generic. Thank you for the honest do nothing. Um, prescribe higher dose and split pills. Refer to pharma assistance programs. They can be really helpful. Again, part of the marketing, but it can be helpful. Suggest so over the counter equivalents. Uh, refer to social worker or government agency, right? Um, so, uh, do you need a Medicare Part D if you're Medicare? Do you need um, Medicaid because you're not, uh, uh, you can't afford uh, this at all? So, uh, let's uh, compare that. Good RX. I'm really happy that uh, people are putting in good RX. And by the way, for the thing that changed from nine to twenty dollars, the pharmacist thankfully just automatically used good RX. It would have been like sixty dollars for me in this new insurance otherwise. Yeah. Free samples. Now, does DOD allow free samples? No. No. Okay, I didn't think. So. I mean, the VA doesn't either. Um, so. All right, so we, we recommend these three um, questions. All right, so hopefully this is the, the entry point. Uh, it doesn't take too long, uh, so that it addresses the time, it allows for that discomfort to be addressed, and then allows you to uh, develop solutions with your uh, patient. How much is your copay? I went in the first time, like I said, after four years, I had no idea, it was new insurance, I had no idea what my copay was. Uh, what do you have to give up for, uh, to pay for this? For many of us, the answer is nothing. Uh, but for many, many, many of us, the answer is I'm going to have to look at how much it is and then I'm, I'm going to decide, right? And it might be that I don't buy, I don't get it for another two weeks until the paycheck comes in or until the other medication that my X, Y, and Z person needs is paid for. Have you ever stopped taking a medication because you couldn't afford it? So three really simple questions uh, about medications. Uh, I think that the trickiest one on here is the copay, because not only do uh, you know you don't know what category as a patient, because most of us have tiered copays uh, in uh, our pharmaceutical plans. So it might be ten dollars for like generic, twenty dollars for their preferred, and then forty dollars for everything else, um, and you wouldn't necessarily know what that is. Okay, become educated about the cost of treatment. So what can we do about it? We can discuss cost, we can ask those three questions, we can reduce discomfort, we can make time, we can also become educated about the cost of treatment. So does anyone know about a new law as of this year that helps all of us become more aware? Okay, there is a new law, hooray, <laughs> right? So it's part of, of course, everything Everything that seems to have to, anything to do with healthcare seems to be related to the Oral Care Act that was like now it's 10 years old, but nonetheless, ripples continue. Um, so the final rule, which purports to define standard charges, okay, requires hospital to make public five types of charges. Gross charges, non-discounted rate as reflected in a 
hospital's charge monster. So a charge monster is this huge document that every hospital already has, but has never shared publicly in the past that has theoretically what they charge for everything, right? Everything. Discounted cash prices, the rate the hospital would charge individuals who pay cash or cash equivalent, pair specific negotiated charges, right? And then de-identified minimum negotiated range, uh, rates and then maximum. So, so why is this so specific? Because guess what? So when my parents moved here about 10 years ago, they, were, they, they had no insurance. This was before the ACA as well. And uh, my father needed, or one of my parents needed some sort of imaging. So we called around hospitals. They couldn't tell us what it might cost uh, out of pocket. Um, and if you happen to find something on their website or they happen to tell you, they weren't certain that when you came in that that would be the actual thing that would charge you. Because they're like, well, yeah, that's listed, but it depends on a lot of things. Like what things? <laughs> you know, like how could you not know what the uh, cost is of something? So that's, that's partly why. The other thing is, is that sometimes people will list things, but then when you actually ask them, well, I'm going to be, be paying cash, they're like, oh, well, then that's a different rate. Um, right, um, and uh, so so the so the government wanted to have it very clear and spelled out what the cost would be for someone depending on uh, what uh, your situation would be. Right now, will this completely make it very clear? No, uh, but at least it's a start. At least it's a start so that people know. And this took it, uh, effect this year. So theoretically, you can go to a facility. Now, I don't know if you knew there was about an article about, about seven, eight years ago where they looked at uh, different hospitals where they were able to get access to the charge monsters of hospitals in kind of the Boston, Massachusetts area. There was over a 200% swing in prices. I mean, it's just like crazy. You just don't know what you're getting. All right, but um, uh, you know, um, the slide, the first one used to be good RX, but I figured so many people now know good RX that there was no point in putting it on. But, but when we first used to teach this, most people did not know about or had not heard about good RX. Just want to point out there are these other websites uh, called like uh, Clear Health Costs, Healthcare Blue Book. So you can put in, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar to good RX. Um, I would do, this is what I did for my parents ultimately, and some, it helped, but again, you know, they can only post data that they can get their hands on. Uh, and before this law, I mean, they themselves can't, couldn't get their hands on everything. So it, it, there were big holes, same pricing healthcare. So just different ways that you could look up depending on what your circumstances were to kind of compare. Um, has anyone ever tried to buy a medication out of pocket? Or, or, or I see people who've used good RX. Have you, uh, if for people who've used good RX, have you noticed the price differences in like the zip code that you looked in? Yeah, e even among the, you know, if there are five pharmacies listed, one might sell it for $5 and it may be $50 at another one. And yeah, CVS, it's huge. <laughs> CVS seems to be the more expensive one. <laughs> my, that's my experience too. Yeah, the CVS always seems to have the higher price. I don't know why, but yeah, it's a huge swing, you know. And it's all in your. And then, um, so say you're doing good RX. The problem becomes is that certain medications might be cheaper at once. If you're on say four medications, you may have to. If you really want the best price, you may end up going to three or four different pharmacies. Because there's no consistency. You, your antihypertensive might be cheaper at this place, but then the other place has that much. If you really want to save, some some places have them on their four dollar or two dollar plan. Some have them the same medication. You know, it's only ten dollars. Say it's only an eight dollar difference. But why? Why is it so much cheaper at one place and so such a different price at another place? And these are neighboring, um, you know, neighboring uh, uh, pharmacies or grocery stores. So really, no method that we can, you know, they they know they price it and they kind of like grocery shopping, you know, where you might think you're getting a good deal because something's really cheap, but then if you average it out, um, it may not have been so good because other things may not be the same price. 
All right. So again, I've you know, and I'll make these slides available so you have all of this information, including all of those websites, if you want to look at them and kind of figure out maybe in your area. And again, uh, you all are DoD, but you're, you know, all physicians, and inevitably people will be asking you like, do you know where a good place or an affordable place is? Or I wanted to look into this, and these would be good resources to uh, let people know about. It. Finally, integrate cost considerations into medical education. So let's, that's, that's where we're at right now. So here's the ACGME statement. I'm sorry, but the past reason to, or quotation marks are floating away. Right, so, so we, you know, we're charged with making sure residents learn this. Uh, any thoughts on what systems-based practice is? my favorite competency <laughs> okay so it's working effectively in various coordinating patient care prepare an adequate discharge i mean i think this is especially interesting and challenging sometimes in dod right because there's there's there are patients within their service members and there are so many rules and regulations so knowing how best to optimize there might be ramifications that are explicit and then also implicit uh, it's, it's a very tightly knit community. So the system is very closed and knowing how the system works and how to make sure, especially in psychiatry and mental health, to safeguard uh, the service member is an important part of that, uh, while also, of course, making sure that uh, their ability to perform their duty is also not compromised. But enhance patient safety, understanding the financing of psychiatric practice. So I hope that people really like systems-based practice as a competency as much as I do. I think it's like uh, it's one of those things that doesn't always get explicitly taught, but is a really important part of uh, good care and good uh, skills as a physician. Um, and this is this is just a sense of like how people learn this. Um, you know, so uh, as uh, clinicians. Uh, we kind of go from clerkship, sub-internship, internship, and there's this nice trajectory, right? And we keep getting better and better. Um, in teachers, the, their knowledge kind of, there's not that much gain in the beginning part. And it's, there's a really high gain in the residency because that's when you're doing a lot of teaching. And then there's steady uh, movement after that. Finally, a manager of resources we don't tend to learn that very much at all, even including residency. And of course, the hope is that we shift this curve by having sessions like this and others uh, so that the red curve is not so flat all the way through residency, but that there is incremental increase in knowledge and ability to manage resources even during residency. Uh, I mean, this is only for you guys to see. So this is SBP2, resource management specifically. So um, it's a milestone uh, competency. All right, so some ideas. Incorporate cost into the SOAP note. Uh, so call it SOAP dollar, right? Sign SOAPs. Um, so just include, and it doesn't have to be just cost. It could be about high value care. Uh, you know, no, no indication for repeat CMP given this, that, or the other parameter. We'll defer until next week. Develop a case-based uh, curriculum focused on cost. So just like we would do, like, say, a psychopharm or a psychotherapy case presentation, do something that involves high-value care. It could be just one journal club a, a year, right? But it could be the one that focuses on that. Case conference on cost. Uh, Role-play discussions of cost considerations with patients. You know, how do you broach those? How do you, you know, I think uh, one thing that many of us are nervous about is to kind of have that implication that, Oh, you can't quote unquote afford your care. So I'm 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 implying that you don't have the resources to pay for this, um, and uh, you don't want to that that we might be casting kind of judgment on them. Include financial concerns and rounds. Um, I this is this is one way that I can influence uh, the most. Include prices of tests and procedures and information systems. Um, at least CPRS here locally has it. Uh, have you guys moved to? Oh geez, I've forgotten what contract the VA has. But you guys are you guys are getting uh, Genesis, right? At some no, point. something else. Cerner. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's it's Genesis. So oh, it's, it's, 
Yeah, it's the shell that the DODs put on it. But we'll. Be oh, I see. I see. So you've already moved. Yes, I think prices should be on there. And I've been showing, uh, you know, residents medication prices for a number of years. Include feedback about the financial aspects of practice patterns. These make rounds and discussions sometimes longer and painful. But uh, but you know, I think even if we do it infrequently, but uh, at least with some regularity, it it becomes part of the process. Now, I did want to include, you know, I, I think one thing that kind of someone uh, uh, had mentioned also in the chat box is just about like, you know, how, how do you do this so that you can do it well or that you're not kind of uh, not serving the person well. So there are some ethical considerations. And I read this great article and it's cited here about just how to conceptualize value when you're thinking about high value and cost. There's some considerations that are ethically obligatory. Okay, inclusion of value is based on strong and sound evidence, and the patient would receive equivalent or superior care at a lower cost. So we are ethically obligated to then consider value. We shouldn't overlook it. This ethically permissible. So mm, you know there might be a benefit. We're not sure, um, and while the cost might be greater, it seems that we should go ahead and uh, move forward with a more, uh, a less uh, valued intervention. And finally, ethically suspect uh, would be situations in which the treatment is withheld by placing societal needs over the fiduciary responsibility to the patient, right? So, um, I mean, this, for instance, I mean, this is more commonly say something like uh, a cancer medication, right? A cancer medication can be anywhere from 10,000 a month to $200,000 a year. And you go, you know what? Your chances are so slim, and that two hundred thousand could be so much better used by, if I did X, Y, or Z, or withheld this treatment and didn't tell you about the option or dissuaded you from take uh, selecting that. That would be ethically suspect. We, you know, we don't want value to take over the fiduciary responsibility to the patient. Uh, ethically obligatory would be always marking generic on your prescriptions so that when somebody takes a prescription to um, the pharmacy, you know, they're like, uh, they can automatically do the generic and they don't end up always doing um, branded medications. Oops, sorry. Okay, and, and uh, there was also this book that came out, I think just last year, and I don't get any proceeds. I, I just have a chapter in there about seeking value, uh, balancing cost and quality in psychiatric care. This was its first kind. Again, you know, when we read a lot of, of, of uh, non-psychiatry literature, it doesn't resonate with us because it's so much more focused on procedures and diagnostics, and we tend not to have those. But this book takes a whole look at all the aspects within psychiatric uh, care. Okay, and uh, with just a few minutes left, I wanted to end with that and see if there were any other questions. So I, I uh, uh, between the short break, I uh, placed uh, uh, a feedback link so I can give that feedback to Dr. Azar Ali uh, for his future presentations. And then uh, uh, we, we still have a couple of minutes. Any questions for him? Comments, thoughts? Anyone feel like um, if you're willing to share that this, you know, it, it just is not our realm. Now, hopefully people feel comfortable enough to share if they were, um, but glad that, you know, I, I mean, hopefully people do feel like we have some role. Oh, and I'm just, uh, reading, let's see, there's some comments maybe. So, Did, sir, I, I think mm -hmm. I think it just gave us a lot to ponder on. I think that might be what, where the lack of um, conversation is happening. Because this is, I would say, a relatively new topic for many of us and kind of thinking about the personal responsibility that we could have in this discussion moving forward, I think just gives us a lot to kind of think about, so. Yeah. And so, Doctor, thank you, um, Doctor Wester. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it is, and it's about well, 
uh, if you went through med school and now some portion of residency, no one mentioning it, and why did, why is it that important? If it's that important, why is this the first time I'm hearing about it, or why is it someone now asking me to, uh, to think of this as part of my uh, roles and responsibility? And, and I think that's part of the problem is that we don't talk about it soon enough, so it doesn't seem to become part of that um, responsibility. Uh, Dr. Fisher also mentions about just the concern, and, and yeah, there are, I mean, there certainly are um, bioequivalency issues that can come up uh, with generics, and sometimes we'll get reports like, oh, we're holding this because, the, you know, something was found, but by and far, uh, you know, and, and especially things manufactured in the U.S., so we're not talking about uh, foreign manufactured things that really the, the, the U.S. doesn't tend to import uh, medications from other countries, uh, it tends to ma manufacture its own, a lot of it being Puerto Rico. Um, but uh, there tend not to be those concerns. So, uh, so Dr. Azra Ali, I, I really appreciate it. You know, I think one of the things that happens uh, when we graduate is it gets less and less common where we're sitting down in a presentation where there are things that we have not heard of, right? So, because you, you start to hear things and, and, and so the unknown unknown shrinks, that unknown unknown box. Uh, but I, I would have to be honest with you, a lot of these ideas that you had, I love that chart with uh, the outcomes versus uh, the cost. I really love that mental model, it was very powerful, I thought. Um, but a lot of these ideas were brand new to me. And I think another element of this is I would have never invited you had we not done poorly on the ACGME survey. So it just goes to show sort of the secondary motivation and how we deprioritize this discussion, uh, even though it's literally the wheels on the vehicle. Right? You could have the best engine in it, but, the, but you, you, got to, you cannot bankrupt the country. And uh, in the DOD, the medical costs are bankrupting the DOD. We won't have enough money for bullets um, and beans if we're spending everything on the Band-Aid. So I, I really appreciate uh, you coming, and uh, you're, you're welcome to stay in. We're going to give the residents a few minutes of break, and then we'll go with, uh, with our uh, pharmacy team uh, to tell us some more specific things related to uh, cost. Uh, from uh, um, psychopharmacotherapy, and then I, I also will submit to you the feedback that I get uh, from the residents. So thank you so thank much. You. Thanks I so much for the opportunity, and thanks for everyone's participation. Thank you so much.